I'm Katie and this is episode 52 of Ornamentations and for today I have a lot of whip progress to share. I have been making wonderful progress on my two samplers that I'm working on. I have a bling and project bag update because I know a lot of you have been enjoying following along with that and I've been having a lot of fun with it myself. And then I also have some Christmas in July to share with you just in case you're feeling the Christmas in July and would like a little inspiration and some silk conversions on what to stitch this month. But we'll start today with just some quick kit updates. My own Christmas in July kit, Santa Stops Here, is fully sold out. Thank you so much. The response to that was just incredible. And again, thank you. However, the Addicts kits for my conversion of my home sweet home from Bender Gervais, they still have some in stock. These are the gorgeous threads, don't miss the white up there, and then I'm going to insert the picture courtesy of the attic of the conversion with Carolyn's start of the threads on Himalayan Fog, one of the two suggested linen choices. I'll put all the details about how to order in the episode description. Again, contact the attic on those, and I'm really excited to see your starts on those. Please tag me on Instagram if you stitch with that or any of my conversions at K Strachan Embroidery. It is wonderful to see these coming to life. And whips, let's start with whips because that's been my stitching for the last two weeks. And today we will start with Plum Street samplers. This happy morning, which we've been following on and off for ooh, some months now. It's taken me a while but I do have wonderful progress to share with you today. Look at that. I'm getting close guys. So what's happened since the last time I have added all of the reds and pinks into the berries. They still do need one more color, which will be a dark gray brown just to put that. There's just a tiny little detailing on the top of each berry. So, you have to pick a color for that and then add that in, which will finish off the border. And I did all of the leaves outlined and filled in. I tested a color for the window outline. That actually looks fine here. However, in person, it's too bright. And this conversion has a lot of bright colors in it. It's got these vibrant reds. It's got these beautiful greens. I also chose quite a vibrant blue as an accent color here, but in a conversion, or at least in this conversion, my vision is for it to be vibrant but balanced. So that means not every color can be a screamer. For every vibrant shade in here, you want something that acts as a counterweight to tone it down a little bit. And not maybe tone down isn't the best word. It's more, it allows a little room for the bright colors to really come through and shine. So in the leaves, you can see I've outlined that with the same vibrant green that's used in the border and the grass, but then filled it in with a more gray green and that tempers it just a little bit. Oh my gosh, does this look amazing or what? I actually think this piece shows up beautifully on camera, much better than most do because of the vibrancy of the silks. But I am hoping to have a finish on this in time to take to the attic summer school so that some of you at least will get to see this in person because it is, I can attest, even more stunning in person. My to-do list from here on is to finish picking my colors and then I have to attack the star up in the corner. And here, again, red in cross stitch is a really interesting color because it so frequently does not behave in the ways you might expect. On the pattern, you can see that the star is worked in the darkest red. I had looked at this and thought, hmm, that's a little too dark. I think the contrast is a little too much. What I really want is to get a good, vibrant, darker red in there, but not a screamer shade. And I think that would look a little better. I actually put this color into the conversion. It's used in the berries in the border specifically for that purpose, because this is just, it's beautiful shading. 
and I thought that was gonna be just, that would be exactly right. And then I started working on that yesterday and it looks too much like the border and it looks too much like the barn, even though it is in fact a different red. Again, you see compression with red shades. I did talk about that when I was picking the color for the barns. So I am actually going to go with that darker red. I'll rip this out. I just left it in here to show you how something I had planned for this piece from the beginning <laughs> doesn't work at all. It's not awful. You could do it. It just doesn't serve the same design purpose. So that was definitely an instance of, oh, Katie, you thought that you knew better. Well, not knew better, just had a different vision. I don't. My vision sucks. Well, it sucks with the star. Everything else, I think, is just turning out beautifully. It's so stunning. I love this. Another interesting thing about how reds behave, you may remember the conundrum of the two reds in the barn trying to get enough separation between them so the pattern doesn't didn't disappear the red that's here in the berry that medium shade right next to the darker red the darker red's the same red in the barn the medium shade in the berries is a color that i tried and rejected for the barn because the pattern completely disappeared but once i got it in the berries there is clear separation between that and the red. Sorry, between that and the darker red. Is that making any sense? That's probably not making any sense. I am not just recovering from the flu this time, but I think I'm still a little tired and I may not be making much sense. This conversion is really dominated by the vibrant reds and greens, which I think is part of why it's so striking. As I've mentioned before, red and green are a classic color combination. They're actually what we would call complementary colors. And what I mean by complementary color is colors that are directly across from each other on the color wheel. So red, green, purple, yellow, orange, blue are what we call complementary colors, AKA they're classic color pairings that are dictated by their oppositional nature on the color wheel. This is from a book called The Anatomy of Color, The Story of Heritage Paints and Pigments. It's published by Thames and Hudson. And if you wanna learn about color theory, this isn't a great book for you, but if you just want just eye candy about color history, pigments this is a visually beautiful book you won't actually learn very much from it but it's just full of gorgeousness and all kinds of interesting things from historic color publications and let's see did i have anything else on oh yes i did these are the colors that i'm working with right now on this happy morning isn't that an absolutely stunning color palette? Or it would be if it would stay put and won't stay put. So gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous colors. These are mostly quite vibrant. And this is my gorgeous blue I have to put in. There are little blue accent flowers in among the leaves. So I need to put that in. I think that'll add a little bit of pop. I think the leaves are actually gorgeous as is. But that'll be great. I need to select my off-white so I can finish off the barn and then I'm going to start working the star and then down there to the trees and Tony the Pony, the Shetland who lived on this the family farm that this piece is meant to represent in my adaptation of it. The other thing I wanted to mention about this was the greens. So I have already gone through two entire spools of the vibrant green goblins that's used for the border, for the grass, for the outlining of the leaves, and for the trees to the side of the barn. Now I did do more fill in here on the grass than if you were following the chart exactly but not that much more when you consider that I filled in a fair amount with trees. And 
that second spool didn't take me all of the way through the leaves here. I only got this far. I will insert a photo of how far that second spool took me. Now, when you consider that if you were stitching it exactly as charted, you would still have to make the rest of the leaves and the trees, which are some pretty solid block stitching. That seems to me to be quite uncomfortably tight. The pattern calls for two skeins of that color. I'm going to just make an executive decision here and put three in the kit so that you have the option of stitching the grass as I've stitched it or if you want to stitch it exactly as charted that you're very comfortable on your greens that if you make a mistake you're not running out. I just think it's an awful, awful feeling to be running down your thread and wondering if you're going to be able to finish your piece. So three spools on the green for this because there is certainly a lot of it and also if you have a little extra, is that a terrible thing? I don't think it's a terrible thing. This is one of my absolute favorite greens. It's new in Goblins and Oh, is it luscious or what? I just love this piece. I've been spending more time over it over the last on it over the last couple of weeks and it's been lovely to get back to it. So for the next couple of weeks, my goals on this are to make progress and to fill out the color conversion on this happy morning. We'll see on the next episode how far I get. And then with that, let's move on. Actually, I'm going to rearrange a couple of things. So I'm going to pause this and then we'll move on to my next whip. Next whip, Modern Folk Embroidery, aka GIT, the Fearlandis Sampler. I told you the last time that my progress is going to slow and I wasn't going to have much time for this going forward. It turns out that I tell you guys and myself, not intentionally lying, a fat lot of lies about this sampler because first it was, oh, I'm not going to start this. I just love it. I bought the chart because maybe I'll stitch it one day, someday far in the future, which turned into an immediate start and blazing progress. And then last episode it was, oh, I'm not going to spend as much time on this. I think my progress is really slow. And obviously that was complete and utter bull too because Oh look, I didn't slow down at all. I finished the bands across the top, so now I will be able to cut this down. I did want to show you how much I was gonna have to cut this down before I actually took scissors to it. I did measure for three inch margins and then I left two on this side. I am awful about placing my samplers on the fabric because again here I've got this huge margin at the bottom very tight at the top I can't count I can't measure I don't know I'm just for whatever reason I'm bad at that part of things so got unequal margins here I've got the measured three inches at the top and then I started over two that gives me an extra inch on this side regardless and then the rest of the margin here that I'm going to cut off is from this being an unequal weave. 63 threads across, 53 threads running vertically. Oh my gosh, gorgeous. I wanted to get those bands running across the top in so that I could cut it down and then I took the alphabet to the halfway point which is the K so that I could just double check my work before I went ahead and took scissors to this. I am going to leave a generous margin, but on something the size you really can't be too careful. So I checked my work just by putting the bands together, folding it in half, and then checking that the halfway point was where the chart said it should be. So far here, I am actually correct. I do have one, no actually two small flubs on this, tiny little dividing tree of life is one stitch off. That means it's actually going to run into this one I'm putting in now. I think what I'm going to do here is just go ahead. I know where the error is. So if I stitch it, I keep going, I look at it and I think I can't stand it. Then I'll go ahead and take it out. It is a very small motif. I know exactly where the error is. I can fix it without too much of a problem. Just 
given how big this is, I don't think you really want to be going back and repeating your stitching if you don't absolutely have to. I also did make a mistake on the letter H. It's one stitch too short. It's supposed to be the same height as the I and the K. I left out a stitch in the middle. I was tired. I was doing in this, this in the evening to unwind. Whatever. The letters aren't actually even and that's completely consistent with the chart. So that's a, definitely going to leave it. And then, as you can see from the last time, I finished that second Tree of Life. Sorry, let me. Oh, is that amazing or what? I am still totally obsessed with this piece. It is utterly fantastic. And then I've started putting in the third, the middle Tree of Life. Is this absolutely blazing progress or what? Of course it's blazing progress until you look at everything else that goes beneath it. Oh dear. And I am pretty far into my first 100 meter spool of Swasophene. I think I should finish most of this third tree of life with what I've got left on the spool, but that actually puts me slightly ahead of target on thread use. So I'm good with what I've got, and you heard my whole blah, 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 blah about thread color choice and then buying your thread for this project on the last episode. Although I do want to verbally correct something I mentioned in the last episode. I said eight spools, and I put in a text correction in the video, but in case you were stitching and you missed that, the eight spool number is for 100 meter spools. If you're doing 103 or goblins, anything on 50 meter spools or skeins, then you need double that. You need 16. Again, tired, recovering from the flu, kind of a mess last time. I'm still absolutely loving scales. You can see which half I ironed. I only ironed around what I've been working on so that it would show nicely on camera. I am way too lazy to iron this entire gigantic piece of fabric. But anyways, I'm still absolutely loving the Sophine and Sicilian Marzipan combination. Watching this come together, the way the motifs lock together, it's just absolutely amazing. That's the AKGIT sampler from Modern Folk Embroidery, and you'll be seeing a lot of this because apparently, oh, I'll have less time for it. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything at all. I'm a liar. Oh, boy. And project bag update, or rather, bling update. When last we spoke, I had just finished this green fob and I was looking for a home for it. I did actually end up buying some Liberty fabric for it and this is an old, no longer in print colorway of William Morris's Lawden. The greens looked a lot more blue-green online. I thought it was going to be a perfect match for this. They're actually much more olivey toned, which doesn't bother me at all. I do tend to like my greens more in the yellow green category. However, when this showed, it wasn't necessarily a great pairing for the green fob. As you can see, I ended up putting that here on the peacock back. I honestly, I reserve the right to just move these around as much as I want because I don't actually love pink that much, but the light pink tones in this struck me as the perfect home for this fabulous pink fob. I hope to make this into a project bag sometime soon. As you can see, I've done absolutely nothing other than mentally pair bling with it. I have not cut the pieces. I have not assembled the pieces. Hopefully I will do that before the next time. Or I don't know, maybe I'll completely reverse course, make a fob especially for that and put the pink back on my fabulous peacock back. It certainly has much more pop than the green does, but I do kind of like how the green is totally harmonious with the peacock bag. It picks up some of the background greenery in this. So 
Hey, vote in the comments. Let me know what you think. Am I totally barking mad taking the pink off my peacock bag? So that was my haul. I did have one other thing, but it wasn't for myself. So it only sort of counts, right? Summer school is coming. I am in the big push to get everything ready for myself as a teacher for summer school. And part of that has meant making sure my mom has all the stitchy accessories. She needs to go to summer school and she had admired the little vinyl front bag that we got from Jean when I went to the attic in April. So I contacted the seller, The Missing Needle, on Etsy. I will link her shop. She didn't have anything of that size in her Etsy shop, so I just asked her if she'd be willing to make something custom, something in prints my mom would like. And, oh, you guys, I think I was a nightmare to deal with because I just had really, I had a lot of trouble articulating what my mom would like, so she would send me fabrics. I'm like, no, no, not that. Um, However, we got there in the end. She was really patient with me, which is why I have to give her a shout out here. She could not have been nicer with my back and forth. So we chose the Blackbird Green because my mom loves green sampler fabric for the lining and then a beautiful kind of bluey green print with roses and greenery on it. My mom is a rose gardener. She loves her garden generally, but what she really, really loves are her roses so I got this for I'm gonna add a little fob to it for just a little sparkle cuz I mean come on gotta have sparkle on your bags and then that'll hold just her spools her scissors all her little accessories her I will cut you needle book as seen on the last episode that was so much fun to make guys if you want a just quick fun little project that makes for beautiful finish. Stacy Stacey Nash's I Will Cut You Scissors Cape is it. It's fabulous. Anyways, so special thanks to the missing needle who is <laughs> really so nice about my waffling on fabrics. That's going to my mom if you're going to summer school. You'll see her with it and yeah, I think we ended up with the perfect combination. She'll love this. Okay, where else? Oh, Christmas in July. Sorry, apparently I am still pretty scatterbrained and have not recovered at all from the flu two weeks ago. Christmas in July. I have not done any Christmas in July stitching at all because it's all been this happy morning and the Fairland is sampler that I just cannot get enough of. However, I thought I would share some of my particular favorites from past holidays that have silk conversions published and available. I'll put the episode where the conversion of, for each of these can be found. If you're looking for a guide to all of my silk conversions, that's also on my episode guide on my website. I'll link that too. So I thought I'd just share a few favorites that might give you some inspiration if you're looking for a silk conversion, something to stitch or something to kit up and plan to stitch for the upcoming holiday season. And we'll go most recent first. You'll, all of these have been on my channel before for long time viewers. These will be repeats. I hope you won't mind seeing them again. And we'll start with some of my sparkle prim. This is one of the Prairie Schoolers. Santa's, I can't honestly remember which, which I then put crystal pendants on the hanger. I used a Verisois metallic braid and Swa 103 and then I just took the needle through the braid back and forth and then sewed the pendants into the hanger. I do hope to eventually do a tutorial on this. It is a really busy time right now so that would probably be closer to the holidays. And then this is also Prairie Schooler Santa's Night. I added some sequins to with the snow on the roof of the house to give it again that sparkle prim and then the edging on this one is just a tiny four millimeter briolette anchored with a seed bead at the top so katie's sparkle prim both very schooler and then on that theme because i was really feeling the cloister cream 
and the sparkles. This is a very old pattern from Brenda Gervais, Be Merry and Bright. I edited a little bit and again I did the sequins. This and the other two I just showed would be great choices because if you're looking to start with silks or kit something up because they have fewer colors, they're not very large, they're not a huge commitment of either time or money. And I did want to talk about trying out silk since I know many of you have recently tried silk for the first time either through one of my kits or one of my conversions or something else. Stitching with silk is not obligatory. You should always do what suits you, what suits your budget. It's not necessary to love silk, but I did want to explain why I love silk. If you are a regular viewer of my channel, you'll know that I stitch with silk pretty much exclusively and more than that, I stitch with spooled silks from Averisois pretty much exclusively. And that's not just because they're beautiful, although they are beautiful. I think you can't beat the rich color and the shine and the luster of the thread, but it's actually for the pleasure of the stitching experience. High quality silk is really smooth to stitch with, so your thread just passes through the linen like butter. As I like to talk about a lot, it gives you these really sharp defined crosses when you've got the thickness of the thread paired well with the linen. It's got space to sit really neatly in the weave and that gives you a look and an experience that I just love. So that's why I am pretty much exclusively a silk stitcher. But again, you should always do what works for you. And then, oh, one of my absolute favorites from Street Samplers this joyous season. This was a kit and normally conversions for kits are exclusive to those kits. However, this wasn't intended to be a kit. The conversion was published before it was ever a kit and I never took it down. So if you missed the kit for this joyous season, you can still stitch this, although you do need to make at least one thread substitution and I don't have a suggestion on that. You would probably have to call someplace like the attic and get a suggestion. What I know is a problem, it limited the kits, is this wonderful orange red gold ones here. I think that's 2636. That's inactive. I bought out the stock for the Joyous Season kits. So you would definitely need a substitute for that. I think the other colors in this piece are still active and probably can be obtained. But again, I would talk to the attic about that or needle in a stack. So this joyous season, which I finished as a pillow, I did take out the words, um, as you know, if you've been watching my channel for a long time, I hate stitching letters. So that was a no brainer for me, but the kit and of course the conversion includes enough thread to stitch it exactly as charted. I do try and make kits as flexible as chart as possible so that you're not stuck following my cho choices if you'd rather stitch the pattern as the designer designed it, which is always of course a good thing to do. This was so fun. I absolutely loved it and it will definitely get pride of place in my holiday decorations again this year. One of my favorite stitches from the last couple of years and I think Plum Street Samplers was already on my radar. This was not the first piece I had done from her but I enjoyed this so much that it really made me think I needed to be doing more Plum Street as you can see. I've followed through on that and I think there will be a lot more Palm Street in my future. So this joyous season is what we have to think for that. Oh, it's wonderful. I really enjoyed the flowers. Absolutely gorgeous. And then two on Wild Honey, which is a 37 count legacy linen. It's pinkish, but with enough gray in it that it's not pink pink. It shows up holiday colors really well. This is Artful Offerings Cranberry Christmas. I loved this pattern because of all the negative space and the delicate colors. So it, when I saw the chart, I thought, you know, if you put that on the right ground linen, really nailed the silk colors, it would be absolutely gorgeous. And I think it is. This is great. This was a fairly quick stitch. There's not that much to this one, so that's a good 
fun pick and then always one of my favorites. This is Brenda Gervais and I'm actually blanking on the name for this. I did not pull the charts for all of these as you can see, but uh, the red, the green on the pink, I just think it makes for absolutely gorgeous piece. And again, all of the links to the original episodes where these appeared with their silk conversions. These are all stitched with silk conversions done by me that are published and available on my floss tube. And so I hope you enjoyed that. That was my little, oh wait, I actually forgot one. Oh gosh. I actually had trouble winnowing this down because we could have done a much longer finished braid. I have lots and lots of holiday stitches, but I stuck it to just a few rather more recent favorites that you could find threads for. This is another Brenda Gervais fur. It's cold, and I just loved this one. So much fun. Mm. Really, really fun little piece. Again, I will put the links and information for all of those conversions in the description for this episode. I hope you find something that you might want to stitch either for Christmas in July or for holiday, which is why it weighs away, but I am already thinking about it. I will be doing a big thing of holiday again this year, lots of holiday stitching, and then we will have multiple holiday kits on offer. What else did I have today? Mentally, totally, I don't know, off elsewhere, I guess. Ah, okay, now I remember. So the last major news item I have for you is that I have been very busy working towards the upcoming site slate of online classes for this year. That was the Elizabethan Valentine. There is a new class opening for registration in mid-September and I will be showing you the project on the next floss tube. I'm very excited about it. It's a beautiful piece that is a companion to the Elizabethan Valentine, although the Elizabethan Valentine is not a prerequisite to take the glass. They just are two beautiful things that go together. You might want to have them both. And then the Elizabethan Valentine will run again. I am hoping that that will open for registration in September, however, with the likely UPS strike and just the complex nature of that particular kit, it may not open for registration in September, although it definitely will run again. It should open for registration sooner rather than later. So if you missed out on the first running of the Elizabethan Valentine, make sure to get on the mailing list for that class. There will be a notification sent out for specifically when the next running of the Elizabethan Valentine opens for registration. There will be a link in the description. But the next class, Queen Anne's Pin Pillow, will absolutely definitely be opening for registration in September and I will be showing you that piece on the next episode. So to finish today, gosh I really am losing my train of thought all over the place. I'm not exactly sure why that is. I didn't sleep that well last night we didn't get the heat wave quite as badly here as most of the country and the rest of California did, but it was still hot enough that it was pretty warm in my house last night and I definitely, yeah, I don't sleep very well when it's hot. Anyways, let's get back to actual business and August, August, oh, gonna be here before we know it and that's actually going to be a very exciting month on the channel because Mid-August is my second floss to anniversary. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I don't know where the time has gone. And to celebrate my second floss to anniversary, we'll be doing an all August Lollapalooza of greatness. And for that, we will have special giveaways. There will be the reveal of the new class project that will be on the next episode. And then on episode 54 in mid-August, I will be showing you my first casket finish. You saw the finish of the Brennamark casket earlier, I don't know, this is a couple months ago now, I think. April? That was in April. And, but before I ever had a floss tube, I actually finished another casket. That hasn't been shown on this channel yet. 
I will be showing you that piece, which is very different from the Bryn casket, but quite spectacular, on episode 54 to celebrate my second anniversary on Paw Soup with one of my most impressive finishes to date. And then at the end of August, we will have the summer school recap. As most of you know, I am teaching. My mom's going with me and we'll both be on to talk about summer school, what I taught, what the project was, and how much we both enjoyed. It hasn't happened yet, but I can already say that we're both gonna have a great time at summer school and at the attic. That, I think, does actually bring me to the end of what I have for today. Having a fairly limited number of whips that are quite large means I have, you know, a fair amount of stitchy hours to show you, but not actually that much to talk about. Next time, progress on my two whips. We'll see if I can power through that third tree of life on the Verland sampler. How many colors can I put into this happy morning? I will also be showing you the finished project for Queen Anne's Pin Pillow, which will be my newest online class opening for registration in September. And all details about that will be given at that time. And yeah, just hopefully lots and lots of progress on my whip. So I'm hoping for some good stitching over the next couple of weeks. I hope there's lots of good stitching in your future as well, that it hasn't been too horribly hot where you live. It seems like it's been horribly hot for everybody the last weekend. Good Lord. Not fun. I don't love summer for that reason. I am not built for, for the heat. I really like cool breezes and moderate temperatures and sweater weather. Summer's not my thing. But I'll see you again in two weeks. And until then, happy stitching. <laughs>